guys, would you grab a Bible? And we are in Philippians tonight. We are in chapter 3. Super excited. It's an amazing chapter. Definitely one that I hope you know and uh, will know afresh. And so hopefully you're making your way there. There are Bibles around you. If for any reason you need one, you didn't bring one, they're around you and chairs nearby, grab one. And then we want to just ask that God would speak to us in this. So I know we've just been praying, but we're going to pray one more time. And it is with an intentional moment that I'm inviting you to present yourself to God right now. I'm inviting you to to step and just ask God to speak to you, that he would take his word and this time and connect it into your life. And so let's ask him to do that. Father, you know us and I love that. Well, there's no other place like this where we can enter into your presence and be fully known. A place where you understand both who we are, where we are, where we've been, where we're going. Lord, your love for us is is bigger than any of us have ever known. Your work is firm. And that's what we need tonight. Would you reach into our lives and so make it that this really does connect with us? Lord, would you look upon our hearts and anything right now that keeps us back from hearing you? Would you graciously deal with? And would you enable us right now to hear your voice and respond to it through your word tonight, through your work? Jesus, we're asking for that and we're asking for it tonight from you. And so we pray this together in your name. Amen. Amen. So when you think about your life, what is your story? Well, you might know what I mean by that. Your story, your life story, if you will. When you think about who you are and and what your whole life could be defined as, as you will, or maybe even more specifically, your story of God at work in your life? Well, again, I am kind of curious if you would know even exactly what I'm talking about and what that would look like. What is your story? I I think about how amazing in one sense that is, and and in one sense we want to look at that as Paul wants to bring before us tonight in Philippians 3 what your story ought to be, what I hope your story is. I think of the the hymn, Blessed Assurance, and some of you are already kind of thinking about it. You know, this is my story. This is my song. Here's what I'm wanting it to say. I'm wanting you to say, hey, this is my story. This is my story. Maybe the details change, but as you go deeper into it and you see what the story is, well, I'm telling you, there is meant to be a similarity, even a, a, a sameness in the sense that God does. And if he can meet you this evening in it, I hope he both helps you to see it but also to be drawn after it. Paul begins our our chapter in verse 3 as he opens this section by saying, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious. For you it is safe. He begins with this phrase, and he's going to say it a couple of times in our section. Rejoice in the Lord. When Paul says this here, please understand, he's not just talking about an emotional response, though that flows out of it. In this section right here, he's asking in one sense, so where do you find your source? What's what's the source? What's the the joy in your life? Where do you find any hope at all? And he's going to call us, he's going to tell us that our joy is meant to be in the Lord. And that's a very focused reminder. That right now, we're not just talking about be happy. Not like you could just walk out and say, well, I just, I'm just going to be happy. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning and I'm going to work really, really hard on being happy. Or I'm going to be really happy be joyful. I'm just going to be joyful. That's not, it's in the Lord. I mean, he's asking you in one sense. So you should find your joy in him. That he ought to be the source of your joy. That he ought to be the thing that when you think about your life story, it ought to be his story. It's my, my joy is in him. I mean, he's the, 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 part, the reason I have any hope at all. Now, as Paul introduces this section, he says this, he's inviting us to rejoice in the Lord, and he tells us right off the bat, hey, you might already know this, but you need to hear it again. 
It's a needed reminder. I like the way he says it. He says, for my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. He says, I know that you know this. This isn't like, you know, I never heard this before kind of information. But we need it. Hey, funny thing. Many times the things that you need most from God are the things that you already know. There are times, certainly, where God opens up something to you that you had no idea of, that you just, wow, I didn't even know that, brand new information, that's wonderful, that does happen. But the interesting thing is if we could catalog it, the times that God really speaks to you, if you walk out of here tonight and you know, hey, God talked to me, it was an evening that God broke through my heart, I'm going to make a guess it might be like, I already knew that. I mean, it's not like Brent, but I, it's fresh to me. It, it, it's deeper to me. And he's telling us, hey, that's what this is. This is to remind us of something that we ought to know. In one sense, it's basic, but it's more than that. He tells us it's safe. It's a cautious reminder. Did you catch it at the end of it there in verse 1? He says, you know, to, for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. And then three times he's going to say, beware. Verse 2, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of mutilation. Beware, beware, beware. I mean, that's what he's going to say. He says, that because if you get this, if you understand what your story is, and you really know what your story is, beware of anything messing that up. Beware of it. And he uses three illustrations. He uses the first dogs. Now, you may already know this, but for some of you, it's like, dogs? I like dogs. I have a dog. I mean, what are you, what are you, what are you talking about? Well, I, I understand Americans. We like our, our pets. That's fine. For Jewish people, dogs, they were not pets. They were mongrels. They were, you know, pack animals that, that were nothing but just, you know, beasts that, that brought in problems. And, he, and he's saying, okay, here's the thing. You need to watch out for things that would come in just as, as a very destructive, animal-like, you know, cruelty, just without sense. Watch out for dogs. Watch out for evil workers, people that would, you know, be telling you things that aren't true, that would lead you down a path that isn't right. Beware of the mutilation. That's an interesting understanding. Maybe it has some reference even to physical, but most likely, in some ways, it's the idea of mutilate, just totally messing it up, messing up everything, taking the truths that we're supposed to know and, and twisting them out of contortion and, 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 and putting them in wrong. And so he says, hey, you just got to be aware I mean, if you can get this, if you can understand what this thing is, where you're to be rejoicing in God, there's a, a, a warning that's here. But in this warning, he says something more. Read it again. I'll just start in verse 2. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. For, here's the reason, that's, that's the, for, we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit rejoice in Christ Jesus, because that's the main theme, right? right there. We're those who, we are the circumcision, we worship God and we do so in the Spirit, and we rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. As he's telling us, he, he's telling us, hey, we need to do this, you ought to be the one that finds your joy in the Lord, and he simply says this, if you're a Christian here tonight, that's who you really are. What he's calling you to do is not to create something that isn't, it doesn't exist. He says, this is who you are. We are the circumcision, those who have been set aside for God, those who have been marked by him to be his people. We are those who have an access into God's presence that we get to worship him in truth and worship him in the spirit. It, it's not like, hey, we can be, or if you work really hard, you can do this. It's a statement of fact. This is who you are. This is who you are. This is an authentic thing. So this is what's really, really fun. Again, because I can tell you this. If you're a Christian here tonight, this is your story. Because this is who you are. This is who you are. This is, this is how it works into your life. And as he's calling us to that, he says, this is what we do. We rejoice in the Lord. We find God to be the hope of our lives, to be our salvation, to be our strength, to be everything. That if you want to ask me what, what it is, it's him. It, it's God. That's, that's my joy. That's my hope. It, it's who he is. 
Well, as he's calling us to that, again, he gives us this first phrase that says it better than I can say it, but I think it's really, really awesome. We're to rejoice in the Lord. And then he couples it with this second thing that he's now going to roll into, and you already heard it, but read it again there in verse 3. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. That's who we are. We are those who rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Have no confidence in the flesh. Well, that's what he wants to help us understand right now. There's a place of coming to this reality where we, <laughs> we have no confidence in us. We have, we have no confidence in who we are. Now, as Paul's explaining this to the Philippians, he does something quite fascinating. He talks about it from his own life and gives us just a glimpse into his own testimony. He says it this way. You know, he says, we're, again, at the end of verse 3, we have no confidence in the flesh, though... I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone thinks that he might have confidence in the flesh, I'm more so. He says, if you think that in one sense that there ought to be something that you can pat yourself on the back on, in some sense that you can say, hey, I have some confidence, Paul says, I had it over on you. I had more than you will ever have. I had more going for me than you have going for you. And that's a pretty amazing statement, but it's altogether true. He begins by letting us know who he is racially. He says it this way. He says uh, in verse 5, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Boy, there's a ton there, but understand this. He was born into the, the nation that was God's people. He was born into it in a very legitimate way, circumcised the right day. He's, he's of the tribe of Benjamin. He says, when you think about what it was to be a, a Jewish person or to be a Hebrew, which was meant to be by God's design to be the people of God, he says, I was, I was that. I, I, I had everything going for me. The moment I was born, I was born well. I mean, I was, I was born into things that, you know, propelled me and, and gave me access to things that others would not have. He says, not only what, did I have that, he says in verse 5, concerning the law, a Pharisee. Religiously, he was a Pharisee. Now, you guys, this is a Wednesday night Bible study, so I, I recognize most of you are more familiar with your Bible, so I'm going to kind of bank into that and just understand, I hope you get it. When you read through the New Testament, we get a glimpse into the Pharisees. This was a religious group of people of the Jewish world who took their faith incredibly seriously. They were passionate. Can I try to say it to you this way? The Pharisees were better than you have ever or will ever be. I mean, they, they, they took everything seriously. They, they tithed everything they had. They tithed their soul. They, 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 they fasted twice a week. They, 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 the way they dressed, what they ate, everything they did, everything that, that processed, everything that they worked through, they were as religious as anybody in our world has ever been. I mean, he's like, you know, you want to talk about, you know, just this religious, you want to talk about one who in that sense you know, concerning the law, concerning what God says. He says, I, I was a Pharisee. I was of that group. I was of this extremely zealous religious group. Beyond that, verse 6, he says, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. He says, I, just, I wasn't just a Pharisee. I took this so seriously that when Christianity comes into being and he sees it as a threat, he doesn't just disagree with it. He's like, I went out of my way. I, 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 I pressed, I pushed, I persecuted, I persecuted the church. And one thing he just wants you to understand is he was no slacker in what he believed. He's passionate. He says, you want to talk about zeal? I have more zeal than you did. <laughs> he says, my zeal compelled me so much that I chased down, I, I, I pursued people. I had all of that. And he says, then not only that, in verse 6, the middle of it says, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. He says, what the law said, that their understanding of the law, he says, I, I, did, I did all of it. I, took, I, I did all, I mean, I did everything I could possibly do. He, you know, from the Jewish understanding into the way they did it, he, he, he did it all. He was incredibly good. 
in that sense. He says, if you want to think about it that way, that's where he was. Now, again, this is Paul's testimony. This is a, a glimpse into his life. But it's an amazing one. Because, see, here's the thing. And I, and I know that you probably know this, but there is a danger in your life right now that you have a propensity to, to lean into your own strength, into your own life. And for some of you, honestly, here's where you are. I mean, you still sit here tonight and you go, well, you know, I may not be the best person, but I'm better than some. You know, I mean, there are, I mean, I'm better than other people. I mean, yeah, yeah, you know, there are, but I'm, I'm a pretty good person on the scheme of things. I mean, I, I, I mean I, I'm, a, I'm a good employee, I'm a good spouse, I'm a good parent, I, uh, you know, I, I, I donate to, to things that are needed, I mean, I, I try to do the right things, I, you know, read things, I try to cook good meals for my family, I mean, I'm a pretty good person, I have some things that are going for me that, you know, make me, you know, I'm not the worst person out there. And Paul said, okay, well, that, that, if that's where you are want to bank into this, he says, I was better than you. He says, I, I, I had everything going for me. I had everything that, that could give me any confidence that I should have had a standing on my own. And then he just says it this way in verse 7. But what things were gained to me, these I've counted loss for Christ. He says, I, I came to the conclusion that none of that helped me at all. And I've counted them loss. Now, here's the, the, the fun thing. Paul's taking us, and if you want to think about it this way, he's taking us into his story. But he's not telling us the events of it. See, you have a story, a testimony, maybe, I hope. If you know Jesus, you have a testimony of what God did in your life, where, where you were and, and how God rescued you. There were events that were a part of that. But Paul's taking us underneath. But we know the events. In fact, if you're reading with us through the Bible... You read it today. I, I, I think that's fascinating. We're not that smart. We didn't do it that way. It's just like, oh, that's really cool. We just happened to be reading in Acts 9 in our Bible reading today. And if you did that, you got to hear part of the story. So let me just put it up on the screen and walk you through Paul's story. It tells us in Acts 9, verse 1, then Saul, that is Paul, his name will be changed to Paul, to, from Saul to Paul. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Remember what he said? He says, I was zealous. I persecuted the church. And so he is breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, it's a term for Christianity that they used in those days, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. I mean, Paul is just, he, I mean, he's, he's like hunted everybody out in Jerusalem that he can find and he can't find anybody else. He's like, I... I got to go somewhere else. Like, would you give me letters? I, I got to go, you know, over here to Damascus. I'm going to go over there. I'm going to find every Christian that's there. I'm gonna, I mean, he is so passionately angry and zealous against Christianity. And the high priest gives him the letters, and he begins to make his, his way to Damascus. And it tells us in verse 3, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly, a light shone around him from heaven. And he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? you got to just imagine, and maybe you have before, thinking through what, what Paul went through. And, and so here he is, he's you know, pursuing, and then this happens, light from heaven knocks him down, he hears this voice, and he responds. He says, who are you, Lord? It's an interesting beginning, by the way, because there's somehow he already has a sense. He doesn't just like, who are you? Who are you, Lord? I mean, there's somehow already in this encounter, there's a, an expression that he recognizes. This, 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 is, this is a God thing. Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said to him, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Is it hard for you to kick against the goats? I love this whole story, and you probably have re heard, read it through or thought it through maybe, or maybe I've even shared it at other times, because here's Jesus. And he's like, Paul, you know, you're persecuting my people, and when you hurt them, you hurt me. Jesus is so connected to you that he takes personally what others would do to you as if it's done to him. That's, that's comforting. 
But then he says this. He says, is it hard for you to kick against the goads? And this gives us a window into what's been happening in Paul's life. What is this, kick against the goad? Well, it's an agricultural illustration that you may or may not understand. In those days, you might have an an oxen or a cow that you were leading along, and so maybe you're out plowing a field or you're doing something, and you got the oxen going, and every now and then, you would have one of those animals that would just get a little bit stubborn. You know, they just didn't feel like doing anything that day, and so you're kind of like, you know, come on, go, and, and then it didn't. So then if, if that really got that way, you had to you, you would sometimes pull out this goad. A goad would be a sharp stick, and you would just tap them. Just, just a little point, just, just a little reminder like you, you, you want to move, you, you, you want to go forward. And many times that's all it took. I mean, it's like, it's like okay, 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 gotcha, gotcha. We, we know, we, you know, I mean, that little moment would sometimes, you know, cause this stubborn animal to realize, you know what, being poked is not as much fun as moving, so we're going to move. But then there were times. Then there were times that some animals would be so obstinate that the moment you start poking them, they do the most crazy thing. They begin to kick the goad. Now, you, don't, you just got to imagine this for a moment. So here's the goad going forward, and here's the leg. So you're poking the leg, and if you kick the goad, what just happened? It just got so much more painful. I mean, it's like I was poking, you're kicking, you, you're, you're making this worse, you're not making this any better. It's like, it's like wow. And, and you almost would look and just, if you could reason with an animal, you'd be like, this is dumb. That's a really hard thing to, you're only making this worse. You're only causing so much more pain. That's what was happening inside Paul. Somehow, Christianity was there. We, we know in reading through Acts that Paul was there when Stephen gives his testimony in Acts chapter 7. It says that Paul was consenting to his death. Many believe that Stephen's words and, and some of the actions of the Christians were getting under his skin. But instead of surrendering to Christ, instead of accepting Christ, he, he, he turns more angry. So what's happening in Paul is in this moment that he is just so fighting against God, he's just making it worse. Hey, just a little quick FYI, not, not new information, but just might be helpful. I just don't know, maybe you, maybe you have someone in your life that's being really difficult about Christ right now and you're disappointed with that. And you're like, man, I just, I, I'm trying to share with this person, I'm trying to share with my, my friend, and they're so mean. I mean, it's like they're going out of their way to be cruel. And I'm, I'm not promising, but I'm just telling you, that might be more encouraging than if somebody were just, you know, oh, that's nice. I'm glad you believe that. That's good for you. It might be more encouraging for somebody to be getting angry and kicking and fighting and, and pushing back. And, and it might be just like, well, I wonder. That there is. And you could almost look and say, is that hard for you? Well, it was for Paul. That's where he is. And so Jesus is speaking. Is it hard for you, Paul? Is, it, is, is, this, is this what you want to do? You're, you're fighting me. And, and so Paul's there. And it says, and so trembling and astonished. He said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, arise and, and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. I mean, this was a break moment. This is a moment where he's like, Lord, okay. You know, I'm not going to fight anymore. I mean, I've been kicking the goad. What do I do now? What am I supposed to do now? And Jesus just tells him, hey, you go. You're going to go into the city and, 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 and we'll deal with that. And so it tells us that immediately in the next verse and the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. A little quick FYI. Your story is your story. Nobody else can enter into it totally. It's your story. They're there, but this is between Jesus and Paul. But it tells us, and Saul arose from the ground, and he went with his eyes opened and saw no one, so he can, he can't, he's kind of blinded by it. They led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and he was there for three days without sight, and he neither ate nor drank. Those are probably a very interesting three days. I mean, three day, at, at the end of the three days, if you read it this morning, Ananias is going to come to him, and he's going to lay hands on him, and Paul's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Hey, in this place, Paul got saved. He got saved. I mean, he, he, he moved from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. I mean, he surrenders to Jesus, and it might have been at that very moment when he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And it might have happened somewhere in those three days, but there was this tearing down and this, this place where he'd been fighting God for so long, and it's done. So it's that, that's how it happened. 
Those are the events. You have a story like that, and it's great to tell that story. Paul does. He tells this story two more times in Acts. You're going to read it two more times as he shares with other people his story, things that God did to get a hold of his life. But what's fascinating where we are in Philippians is he's not telling us the events. He's not telling us, hey, you know, I was journeying to Damascus, and then there was this light, and then there's this voice, and it's Jesus. He's not telling us any of that. He's taking us beneath the surface. And he says, you know what had to happen? Is I had to give up on myself. I had to have no confidence in myself. I had to tear all that down. All these things that I thought made me a good person, that I thought were my standing with God, they didn't do anything for me. He says, I, I, I looked on all of those, and again, he says, those things which were gained to me, verse 7, I've, I've counted loss. I've taken everything that I thought was in my my, my plus column that I, that I counted as, you know, things that were, you know, of benefit to me, that they were assets in my account, and I moved them over to the liability. It's like, I don't, I don't, I don't have anything. I don't have anything. Now, here's what I know. If you know Jesus, somehow this happened. Somehow you came to an end of yourself. It happens in a lot of ways. Some people, it's, it's hitting rock bottom. I mean, life just goes out. I mean, they just, they, they, it goes as low as it can go. It's the prodigal son kind of moment. And you get to there and you're just done. I, I, I don't have anything. Some people, it's a, a spiritual encounter like, like it was with Paul. Some people, it's, it's a huge mental wrestling. And, and I don't know how it happened, but here's what I know. If you're really a child of God, somewhere you came to the place that you like, I don't have anything. I mean, if you're going to ask me, like, why I should be, have joy and why I should feel good about my, my eternity and why I should feel like I'm going to heaven, I don't have anything in my plus column except Jesus. You know, Jesus is, is you know, I, I rejoice in the Lord, and I have no confidence in my flesh. And I'm just telling you, that's fundamental, that's everything, and that's what God has done in you if you're a child of God. If you're not a child of God yet, that's what he's doing. And, and you might not realize it because you might still be here tonight thinking, well, you know, I'm not a bad, bad person. I'm better than some people. And it's like, oh, God's going to work in you till you come to the place you say, I have nothing. I have no reason. I have no confidence in me. And, and I have no confidence in my flesh because that is who we are as Christians. And I just want to remind you of that. Maybe you knew that. Maybe that was something you, you came to when you got saved. And maybe you've kind of moved away from it a little bit. I mean, it's like, well, yeah, I you know, got saved and recognized how much I needed Jesus. But now I'm, I come to church on Wednesday night. And that's in my plus column. You know, it's like, no, wait. I mean, if it's really in the plus, it's all that God did in us. It's not us. It's not anything of us. We have nothing of ourselves to offer. And so Paul says, hey, I have no confidence in my flesh. I, I have nothing there. And as he helps us to understand this, he applies it yet further in verse 8. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. I count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. To use it just as a phrase, he says, here's what I have. I now have the excellence of knowing Jesus. It's one of my favorite sections, and I've shared that with you guys before. I think I shared it even recently on a Sunday morning, so pardon just the, the quick just kind of tying back into it. But I absolutely love it. Because Paul's not just saying, okay, this is what happened when I got saved. He says, I still do. I count it all loss. I take everything that, that was there, and I look on this, and I say, it means nothing, because I found what really makes life life, and he says it's the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, hooper uh, echo in, in Greek, and it has the idea of uh, above holding, would maybe be a, 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 just a very simple translation of it, but it has the idea of far above, far surpassing. Maybe you could even take it, sometimes said, you know, when you think about this word, this word excellence, you could translate it super surpassing. And the idea is, he says, I found Jesus, and it leaves everything else in the dust. I found Jesus, and everything that I thought was important, those were not what made me valuable. Those were not what gave me confidence. I found Jesus, and it wasn't like, well, Jesus, 
my works is like, it's like, it's like this just, it, it's so left everything else behind. He says, I found Christ. I, I, I found him. He says, I, I want to be found in him, not in me, but in his righteousness. Again, just reading it, verse 8, yet I indeed count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the lust of all things, and I count them as rubbish. The idea is stinky, smelly trash. He says, I take all the things that I used to think were good. I'm a Pharisee. I'm a Jew. I'm a good person. I try to keep the law. He says, those are stinky, smelly trash. I count them that way because I have Jesus. I have Jesus. And I went in verse 9, he says, I want to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness which is from God by faith. He says, I want to be found in him. I want to be, I mean, I've, I've figured out that life for me is, is Jesus. Jesus is, 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 is my hope, and to be in Christ is everything. To be saved is everything. That's my hope in him. And as he thinks about this, he ties it back into what Jesus did for us. Obviously, his death and his resurrection. He says it this way, verse 10, that I may know him. I just want to know him, he says, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. There's a lot in there. We do not have time to go into it in great detail, but let's just be simplistic about it. It's Jesus' death and resurrection. He says, my life is found in the cross. My, my hope is found in that Jesus died for my sin and he conquered the grave. I just want to know more about that. My life is found in, 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 in banking into the greatest moment in history so that I'm looking forward to be resurrected now because Jesus was resurrected. I'm going to be resurrected, however that happens. I mean, whether it's the rapture or I die and come back, I mean, I'm going to be resurrected, but all of that's going to happen because of Jesus. Because it's Jesus' death and resurrection. And so he says, I just want, and he says, you know, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. And as he lays all these things out, please kind of catch it again. He's just saying, okay, here's what I am. I, I just want to know him. This isn't just a past tense thing. And I wish I could say that in a better way than I'm saying it. That Jesus would be our Savior. This isn't like, well, yeah, that's what happened the moment I got saved, and, and you know, now I'm kind of going on to you know, uh, kind of post-Christian kind of things, or you know, now I kind of do this on my own. Now in this church, he's like, no, everything I am is wanting to know what I gained in Christ, what he accomplished for me in the cross, what he accomplished for me in the resurrection, and I want to know that. I want to know him. I found my life in Christ. I found my hope in Christ. And as he tells this to us, he, he then launches from there, into his present experience. But let me just pause again just to make sure that you haven't lost me because I'm just telling you again, if you're a Christian, this is your story. One way or another it is. And if this is not your story, then maybe you're not a Christian because this ought to be your story. Your story is my joy is Christ. I, might, my, I rejoice in him. I have no confidence in me. I, I, I'm not thinking, you know, I'm hoping that God and I together will earn my salvation. No, it's, it's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. No confidence in me. In fact, I have found that knowing Jesus leaves everything else behind. It's this excellence of knowing Christ, of, of, of life being found in him. And as he tells us that, he applies it into the present. Verse 12, very familiar verse. Not that I've already attained or am I already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. As Paul is telling us his story, he's telling us how it's working in his life and he's pressing forward. Can I say it simply this way, and, and God help me to say it clearer. Our story is meant to be a continuing story. If you have a story, if your story is of coming to an end of yourself and finding Jesus, that's amazing. But your story is a continuing story, or it's supposed to be. The sad reality is that there are some Christians that have a testimony, 
a testimony of God saving their life. But it's all past tense. I was a drug addict, messed up my life, did a whole bunch of bad things, and then came to an end of myself, and Jesus saved me, and, 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 and I gave my life to him, and I became a Christian. I, I, I was trying to find hope in all the wrong places. I was, you know, pursuing people or relationship or things or joys, and I found none of those satisfied me. And then God got a hold of me, and someone preached the gospel to me, and I got saved. And, and, and so people will tell their story. That's a good thing. I hope you can tell your story. You should tell your story. But if that's where your story ends, then the story is incomplete. Paul's not just telling us, hey, this is what happened on the Damascus Road. I, I, I came to an end of myself. I, I figured out that I have no standing of my own, and my only standing is in Christ. He's not just talking about this as a past tense and theoretical and something that happened to me two years ago or five years ago or 30 years ago. He says, here's where this is in my life. He says, I, I, I'm continuing. He says, I'm, I'm continuing to press on to it. And he says, here's how it works. He says, I have not already attained. I have not. I, I'm not where God has me to be. I'm not the person I ought to be. I, I'm not, and, and I don't mean this in any kind of cruel way, but neither are you. And not anybody in this room, it's like, oh, actually, I am. <laughs> I've arrived. I'm, I'm like the perfect person. It's like, I know you're not, and you know you're not. But here's the thing. Sometimes you have to actually calculate that. That's what Paul does. See, he says, I, I have not already attained, and I'm not perfect yet, but I'm pressing on that I may lay hold, of, lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. I want you to draw your attention to that word count, because in this whole section, Paul is using some accounting terms. He says, you know, things that were assets, I've moved to liabilities. There were things that I thought were going for me. I've recognized those were not helpful to me. He says, now when I'm looking at this, I account this. I intentionally, purposely, legitimize the word just that I, I count. It's like, I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not the person yet that Christ wants me to be. I, I, I'm not yet walking in the fullness of the things that God wants in my life. And so to be tonight a conscious dissatisfaction. I'm not talking about, again, five years ago. I'm not talking about a year ago. I'm talking about right now, where you'd say, I'm, I'm not satisfied. I'm not satisfied with where I am in Christ. I'm not satisfied. I, I, know, I know that Jesus is more than I'm yet experiencing, and I, I know this, and so I'm accounting it right now that where I am is not fully what God would want to do in my life, that, it, that it, what he has is so much more. And, and that's important because if you get comfortable, you'll stay there. And I don't mean this in any kind of cruel way, but I'm just telling you because you, you know it's true. There are some Christians that got comfortable. There are some Christians that read their Bible one time, shared the gospel twice, you know, did a few things, and it's like, okay, I've done. I've kind of done the Christian thing. I've done, you know, I, I did that taught Sunday school. <laughs> I did that. I, I, I did some things. And, 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 and you're almost in that sense of like, I, you know, I don't, you know, that was back then, not now. And, and Paul said, I'm not. I'm not happy with where I am. I'm going to account that. And he says, here's what I'm doing. I'm pressing forward. I'm passionately pressing forward. He says, I do not count myself, verse 13, to have apprehended, but one thing I do. That's a passion. That's a passion. He says, one thing I do. He says, I, I'm pressing, and I absolutely love this. This is really near and dear to my heart, and I have no time to unpack it in its entirety, but this is an important thing. I, thought, I love Paul's statement here, this one thing. I mean, he says, you know, if you could define what today looks like for me, there's one thing that is bigger than anything else. I just want more of Jesus. David would say it this way. When David was sharing it in, in Psalm 27, he says, one thing I've desired of the Lord, that I will seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For you who know your Bibles, you might know David was called a man after God's heart. And I put to you, I believe this is why. Because David says, you know, if, if there's one thing I want, it's God. I, I want him more than I want anything else. I want to be in his presence. I want to hear his voice. I want to see his beauty. I want that more than I want anything else in the world. 
I mean, more than anything else in the world, you could offer me, you know, a European vacation, you could offer me, you know, cars, computers, you could offer me success, you could offer, I, I want, I want God. I found out that God satisfies, and he's the only thing that really satisfies, and I want that bigger than I want anything else in the whole world. Mary, was, it was said this way, she's there at, sitting at Jesus' feet, Martha is distracted, you guys might know the scene in Luke 10. Jesus answered her because Martha comes and tells Jesus, you know, like, get Mary up. Tell her to get busy. She's not doing enough. She needs to serve more. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. One thing is needed. There's one thing. There's only one thing that is really needed. And Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. Mary had chosen to sit at Jesus' feet and hear his words. And she's like, this. It's like that's the one thing that's really needed. Everything else is secondary. And what Paul is saying for him is he believes that. He says, here's what I get. I, I'm not satisfied where I am. I want more of God. I want more of what Jesus is doing, not based on my worth, not based on what I deserve, not based on me earning it, but on grace. I want more of that. I want more of the goodness of Jesus. I want more of the satisfaction, the life, and the fullness that's found in Christ. I want to know more about the cross. I want to know more about the resurrection. He says, so here's what I'm doing. He says in verse 13, one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. And here's how I do it. I, I forget. I choose to say, okay, I'm not going to be held down by my past. You are, many of you here tonight, you're held down by your past. Right now, you're thinking, I tried. I, I re tried to read my Bible. I tried to share the gospel. I tried to, to do it, and you failed. And so now you don't even try. Some of you have some really bad things in your past. And, you're, and as soon as you think about trying to draw near to God, you, you just remember, <laughs> he shouldn't want me. I did some really bad things. Some of you had some really good days. They were really good days. You, you led a youth group. You saw some amazing things happen. You shared the gospel. And, you'd, and, and, and one of the things that can happen is you can remember the past. And Paul says, you know what I do? I forget that. Because today, I want more of Jesus. And I'm not going to count that either my failures or my successes, because he doesn't say which one it is. He says, this one thing I do, I forget the past. What I, what I, what, where I was yesterday, that is not going to define where I am today, either at success or failure. I'm, it says, one thing I do, I forget those things, and I press. I consistently has the idea that I'm trying. I want more of Jesus. I want more of what that is. He says, I press Verse 14, towards the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And I don't know how to say this better than just to say, hey, pressing is effort. Pressing doesn't happen kind of by osmosis. I mean, if you're not intentionally doing this, you're not doing it. If you're not intentionally trying to get closer to Jesus, it's not, it's, it's like, well, you know, I just kind of thought maybe, you know, if I held the Bible and I slept on it, you know, put it under my pillow and it would just, no, I mean, if you want to get closer to Jesus, you're going to have to get, I mean, Paul's like, I'm doing that. I want that. I want to know him. That's what my life is. Because I figured this out. I have no confidence in me. I'm not thinking that it's all about me. And I, but I know this knowing Jesus is better than everything else in the whole world. And I want to be one that finds my life in Jesus. And so that affects my today. That affects what I'm doing. Now, as Paul's telling us, again, this is his story. This is what God had de done in him and was doing in him. But I've already been saying it all evening long, but I want to say it as clear as I can. This is supposed to be your story. This is supposed to be your story. That's what he tells us next. Catch it in verse 15 and 16. Therefore, let us as many as are mature have this mind. Hey, we'll just pause there. Just, you already know what the rest is, but I think it's just fun to think this through. It says, okay, if you're mature tonight... If you are growing up in Christ, if you know, if you're not a baby Christian, if there's some maturity in your life, then you know, that's me too. And you would say, this is my story. This is my song. I mean, this is right there. My, my story is, I rejoice in Christ. I have no confidence in me. I have no confidence in my flesh. My confidence in Christ, and Christ is amazing. He is excellent. He is so far surpassing anything. He satisfies. He's salvation. He's life. He's hope to me. He says, if you're mature, that's your song. That's your story. He says, if, you, if anybody's immature, then this is your mindset. This is how you view life. And he adds to it in verse 15. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. 
And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this. I really like this. I mean, is this still really funny? If, I mean, I'm a, I have a little strange sense of humor, so you're just going to have to go with it. <coughs> God, he's basically saying, if you don't believe this, you will. You know, if, if you don't get this yet, oh, that's what God's teaching you. These are the lessons he's doing. Some of them are hard lessons. Some of this coming to end to yourself, it's like, oh, you're going to learn. <laughs> you're going to learn because this is what God is doing. He says, if you don't believe this, if you're sitting in your seat right now and you're like, that's nice, that's Paul, that's, you know, he's Paul. I mean, what do you do with Paul? I mean, he's just Paul, but I mean, that's not really where I am, and I'm kind of in a little different person, and, you know, I still, you know, I, I don't think I'm a really bad person. I still have some confidence in my flesh. I mean, you wouldn't say it that way, but you are saying it that way when you think, I'm not a terrible person. I'm better than some people. I'm just telling you, you're worse than you have any idea of. You are wor- I mean, your sin is worse and more destructive than you have any idea of. And for some of you, it's like, well, I, I, I'm not really totally there. And that works for some emotional people to get all into Jesus. Not, I'm, not, I'm not as much of that kind of person. This is what God's trying to teach you. I can't guarantee you're going to learn it. But I can guarantee you that the tutor is chasing, that he's working, because this is what he's doing. And I love that Paul says, it's like, if you don't get it, <laughs> you will. You know, you're you're going to because this is what he's going to reveal to you. Nevertheless, verse 16, to the degree that we've already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. He says, nevertheless, okay, wherever you are on this, and here's the thing, probably none of us are like, oh, I'm totally where I need to be in this. It's like, okay, whatever, how much God has revealed this to me, let me walk in that. And it's probably going to grow. It's probably going to grow. I mean, I might think I have no confidence in the flesh, and then God will help me understand. Sometimes I do. <laughs> sometimes I think too much of myself, and he'll just kind of like let me kind of, and, and sometimes I think I'm rejoicing in Christ, and, and he's like, but you know what, wherever I am, this is what I'm going to live for, because here's the thing that he's saying, this is what God is doing, and, and here's again what I'm trying to say to you. What I love about this is, this isn't about the details. The details of your story are different than the person next to you. For some of you, again, life went all the way bad and you came to Jesus. Some of you went really, really good and it wasn't satisfying and you came to Jesus. Some of you just, God took you through so many things and and he's working in you. It's different. Our story is different. But our story is the same. If you're a Christian, God brought you to an end of yourself. God brought you somehow where you realized, I am not going to make this on my own. There's no way. I am not going to get to heaven on my own. I, I, I get it. I'm not good. And you needed Jesus. And God brought you to Jesus. And if, you know, if you're a Christian here tonight, you've come into contact with the Savior of the world. The power of his death, the power of his resurrection has changed your life. And yet it's meant to be a continuing thing. That's our story. That's our story. I, I love this. And so I want you just to think about it again, and then we'll begin to pull it to a close this evening because... I just want this to, to resonate with you. Now, there's a few places you might be with this. It might be, again, here this evening, that this doesn't sound like you at all. You really can be here. You could be watching online right now, and honestly, you're still thinking, I'm not a bad person. I mean, I go to church even. I mean, I, I, I'm a good parent. I'm a good child. I, I, I do my homework. I mean, I, I mean, come on, I don't cheat. I mean, I just, I mean, I, there are things that make me valuable. There are things that make me good. And, and, and I just want to tell you, that's a dangerous place because you're not. And you might be here tonight, and this is not your story, but I want to tell you it needs to be. And the quicker you can come to it, the better off. The quicker that you can Quit fighting against the goats, as Paul would say, as God, Jesus told Paul. Quit resisting that, that you need him and that you're not enough, and then that would be an incredible day because this should be your story. And if it's not your story, I'm inviting you to it. I'm telling others of you that this is your story. And you actually know it, but somehow it's diminished in the last weeks, months, years. It's kind of this chorus that you hear in the background, this is my story, this is my song. But not really. It's not really present in your life right now, and I'm just telling you, it ought to be. This is, this is who we are. 
this, we are those who have no confidence in the flesh and we rejoice in Christ and this is what we are. This is by definition what it is to be a believer and if this is where you're not, if it's, if it's somehow diminished that you need to have yourself tuned and you're out of tune with your story tonight that God would bring you back in tune with his story. So you go, that's, that's my story <laughs> right there. I rejoice in Jesus. I rejoice in the Lord. No confidence in me. Jesus is amazing. Excellence in all of Jesus. And I just, I'm just trying to know him better. That's what my Christian life is about. I'm not trying to earn my salvation. That, that's, that was done on the cross. I just want to know him. I just want to know him. I want to know the Savior that saved me. And that's what my life is about now. And if that's not where you are, I invite you to it. So it could be that this is not your story right now, and it needs to be. It could be that it's your story, but it's become diminished. But I'm also going to be clear. For some of you, this is like, it's right where you are. And it's somehow so encouraging to hear it because you're like, that's my story. That's it right there. I mean, yeah, I get it. That's, I mean, I didn't know it in one sense that that was the tune that was playing, but that's my story right there. And if that's where it is, I just think God would encourage you tonight and say that's exactly what he's doing exactly what he's doing because this is the amazing grace that Jesus works. So you can take your Bibles and close those and let's just take that before God and ask for it. Wherever it's met you this evening, that God would take your life, your story, and bring it along his story. God, I just want to bring this before you and I do so even just praying through the major points that we just covered. God, we are those who rejoice in Christ. If that's who we are tonight, if we're Christians, the very nature of our salvation is we rejoice in you. We find our hope, our life, our being, our satisfaction, our salvation. It's all in you. We look to you. We look to you and we have no confidence in our flesh. We've come to recognize that all of our good works are filthy rags. That everything that we do, it doesn't actually make us better. We couldn't earn even 2% of our salvation. Lord, we, we, can, we have none of that to give. We have no confidence in us. Anything that we do good, actually, you're doing in us, you tell us. So we just come to an end of that right now and say, God, we, we just want to believe that. You put no confidence in us, and where there is confidence that you would just tear that down graciously, gently. But then to find the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, that Jesus, you surpass everything. Giving up my own righteousness, giving up feeling that I could earn my own way, it is, I've lost nothing as I gain you, as I gain Christ, and, and Jesus, you're my everything. I pray that you'd help us to know that, to find that, and it wouldn't just be a past tense, it would be a present tense, that we'd be able to say with, with Paul, I, this one thing I do, I am not where I ought to be. I'm forgetting the past and I am pressing. I am pressing because I want more of you, Jesus. Would you work that into our lives wherever that is? Rescue any this evening that don't have this, who find themselves outside of your story. Would you rescue? For those that it's become diminished and clouded up with other things, just reinvigorate this is their story. For those that find it as their story right now, encourage them. And Lord, you would just cause it to resound in us and draw us to find our life in you. We're just asking for that tonight. In Jesus' name.
greater thing. You're my all, you're my rest, you're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. Now my heart's desire is to know you more to be found in you and known as yours to possess by faith what i could not earn all surpassing gift of righteousness knowing you Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're my rest, you're my joy, my rightness, and I love you, Lord. Oh, to know the power of your risen life and to know you in your suffering. To become like you in your death, my Lord, so with you to live and never die knowing you jesus knowing you there is no greater thing you're my all you're my rest my joy my righteousness you're my all you're my rest, you're my joy, my righteousness. You're my all, you're my rest, you're my joy, my righteousness. And I love you, Lord. And I love you, Lord. And and I love you, Lord. Let's all stand for this last one. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, 
looking about, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Praising my Savior all the day long. Father, we thank you that you are writing a story for us, Lord. Lord, you've, you've begun this story when you saved. And Lord, you are continuing that story day by day. And I just pray, Lord, that we would press on that we would more and more just cry out and desire, Lord, to know you in a greater way. And Lord, that you would cause us, Lord, just to, to walk in you, Lord, that, that your death and your life would be manifest in us, Lord. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.